The AZ industry is rapidly changing, but your team doesn't have time to reinvent workflows for every new technology or client demand. ProjectWise, powered by iTwin, puts you in control and positions your firm for non-disruptive change. Whether you need to improve design quality, optimize existing processes, or even get started with digital delivery and digital twins, ProjectWise enables you to make the most of what you already have without starting over. Visit go.bentley.com forward slash podcast to see how ProjectWise is empowering AEC firms to do more with less. Once again, that's go.bentley.com forward slash podcast to learn more. Engineering Health Wants Podcast for the American Council of Engineering Companies, brought to you by Bentley Systems, the bringers of ProjectWise. It's an infrastructure delivery software system, and very happy for them to sponsor our podcast today at the 2023 Annual Convention on Legislative Summit happening in Washington, D.C., and very pleased to be joined by Marcy Russell. And she is best known, of course, co-host with the Spock Box CNBC. Former. 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 Former, former co-host, Spock Box CNBC, but a noted economist and a speaker who is, uh, I, I know, I, I, I was watching your presentation and I thought it was fantastic because I think that the big thing is, a, is the son of an economist and, and, and all, yeah, I know. Uh, agricultural economists, so even oh, yeah, even, know, really even, even 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 more yeah, narrow, even slicing that baloney yeah, like really oh, yeah, uh, okay yeah, pigs and chickens sent me through college. <laughs> you know, My so, dad's a farmer, so well, same well, for well, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, just yeah. Right? So uh, I actually reinforced. There's a reason why economics is a social science, right? Absolutely. Because absolutely, it's just how am how am what's how am I perceiving the world? And, you know, it's, what's fascinating is that it is true that, that, that this was a real revolution in the economic sciences that started um, really, you know, with Lucas in the 1980s and beginning to understand that people's expectations yeah. of inflation can be just as important yeah. as what the actual number is. That where people think interest rates are headed is really more important than where they are today. In the sense that you think about the housing market yeah. right now, it's kind of in this pause because... Mm-hmm. People expect rates to come down in the future, so they don't want to move right now. Yeah. And they were expecting rates to go up mm-hmm. in 2021, 2022, so everybody rushed to buy when interest yeah. rates were really low. And so expectations can have a really, um, you know, it can be a really critical piece of understanding an economy, particularly one that's so bizarre like the one today. Yeah, exactly. And it's just a, how much for this self fulfilling prophecy. And I mean, I, I don't know what it is about our industry, but you, we've done, been doing these quarterly, you know, surveys of the executives and saying sure. exactly, you know, okay, how, how are you doing and how's the macro economy doing? It's <laughs> always been, you know, well, I don't really like the macro economy. I think the economy is going to take a nosedive, but you know, I'm doing fantastic. And we see that right? across the board. Yeah. It is across the board. I was at a party last year, last summer, and it was in my hometown. I live in a really small town in Michigan. Some people know what I do. Some people don't know that I'm an economist, but I was sitting with a friend who did know mm-hmm. what I, you know, that I was an economist. We started talking about the stock market and everything, and he asked me, did I think the economy was in a recession? Yeah. This was a year ago. Mm-hmm. Is the economy in recession? And I, and before I could even speak, the woman next to me goes, oh, oh, I know the economy's yeah. in recession. So I turned around and I said, well, why don't you tell me about that? Yeah. And she's a small business owner in mm-hmm. my town. So she goes on to tell me all these reasons why she thinks it's in a recession. And I said, yeah. well, how's your business? She goes, gangbusters, yeah. never been better. Never been better. Yeah. Never been better. And it's like yeah. those two things, unless you are in a perfectly counter cyclical business, can't be true. Yeah. So it's absolutely true that there's sort of the micro level of the economy, how people feel about things, and many times that is not reflected in the overall sort yeah. of macroeconomic statistics. 
And as I pointed out to the audience earlier, um, our political affiliations mm -hmm. have become to play more and more of a role in how we feel about the yeah. economy. So, you know, I don't believe the, you know, unemployment statistics, you know, I think it's this or I think it's that. Well, you know, you can think all day long, but there are actual numbers that are put together by professionals yes. who have no dog in the hunt other than they want the number to be right. Yes. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very confident, if not in the actual numbers that come out, then certainly in the direction of whether they're moving up or down in a certain way. Yeah. And also, I think that there's something to be said for the fact that, um, you know, what you just earlier said about how a lot more research is coming out about, you know, how people's perceptions are shaping, you know, the way the economy is going and how the numbers are moving and the fact that we're not in the economy that we were back in the 80s. We're not we're not nowhere close. We're not we're not seeing these interest rates that a lot of young people. I, I, I listen, I was born in 77, so I didn't experience them. But my parents did. And they bought a house in 79 and their interest rate was about. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was about eighteen percent. Yeah, yeah. Right. It I, was probably it was definitely in the double it was digits. In the double back digits, then. and I bought yeah. right as the pandemic set in, and I was at you know practically nothing. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it was beautiful then, but I mean, even when we were seeing like one two percent, that's nothing compared to where we were. And the fact that the the way we are, as as you mentioned, you know, we're a net exporter of energy now, right? We are, 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 are. It's one of the biggest, most underappreciated fundamental changes. Yeah. Now, it does have environmental impacts, and those have to be properly priced in, mm -hmm. right? And one of yeah. the things that economies don't always do so well is price in externalities, yeah. pollution, spillovers mm -hmm. that are negative, and that's the struggle, you yeah. know, around the discussion today. But you can't deny that this is a genuine industry, and that it has, you know, radically changed in many states, mm -hmm. like. Oklahoma, the Dakotas, yeah. places where, you know, th this sort of booming shale oil industry has, has changed, changed dra dramatically. Yeah. You know, it used to be that the only state that benefited from high oil prices was Texas. Yeah, right? now, now it's it's everywhere across the country where either, you know, whether, take the politics out of it, but I mean, Pennsylvania, my own my own state, fracking, there was a, there was a, there was, there was investment there, you have shale, you have everything else. That is completely diversified across the economy, and it's no longer geographically constrained in one area. Yep, that's exactly right. So fundamental, big changes yeah. in the economy. Is it so? I mean, really, it's a question: Is it time to throw out the old book of reporting? Because now you always see the reporting the same way. Yeah. It's kind of going back and using the old argument of saying, "Well, you know, interest rates. You know, the Fed is going to do is either going to raise rates or lower rates," and they kind of go back to the last recession. 2008, where they go back even further and they say, okay, dot-com bubble, like you said, yeah, but yeah. we're not we're not the same country, we're not the same economy, demographically, the way that our economy is set up, the way that, you know, I, it just seems like we're in a different place than we were before, and comparing no longer makes sense. Well, history is always instructive, is. right? Is, yes. You know, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, repeat itself exactly, but it does rhyme, yeah. right? Um, and, and there always are historical lessons to be drawn. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why monetary policy is so hard, why there are so many debates, right, is exactly what you're saying. Think about how much of a struggle it's been for the professionals at the Federal Reserve, who yeah. this is the only thing they do. This yeah, they is their job. Raise or right? They have a lever, and that's it. That's right. That's, that's it. But 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 they even they are struggling mm -hmm. and having to discuss and figure out sort of where you know forecasting is really really hard. It's really yeah. really hard, and it's even harder harder, you know, for the legions of people who don't have PhDs in mm -hmm. economics. But I will say that one of the interesting things that's developed, I would say, in the last five years or so that made forecasting and analysis during the pandemic um, so much easier was the development of, um, you know, big data sets and big data set analyzing tools yeah. that allow you to take things like credit card data 
and analyze consumer spending, not with a month long lag, you can do it in real time. Yeah. We had geographic data that came from Google that told us you know, how people were traveling, where they were going um, at any given time that was economic information yeah. that was extremely valuable. So in some ways, Forecasting has gotten easier, but uh -huh. it's also gotten harder. But the data is so different than it used to be. That raises a really interesting question. So we always talk about AI and emerging technologies, how it's going to impact engineering. But from an econometric standpoint, that's going to change the game because of, oh, you can take these massive historical data sets and you can run different oh, analyses yeah. and come out with different extrapolations. That's right. You can do all sorts of things with history. Yeah. That's absolutely true. But the limit of AI, and it's the same limit, you know, that 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 will it, that will reveal itself across industries, is that's all it can do. Yeah. All it can do is examine what is known already. Yeah. And what makes the world interesting, and what makes human intelligence so different, is that our intelligence creates completely new things out of nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so. Um, AI appears to be reaching kind of this creativity barrier, you know, it can synthesize, you can do all sorts of crazy things with what's already out there that maybe I can't do because I can't learn to speak um, a foreign language like that. So it makes it appear far more powerful um, than I think it really is. It's not creating because it's taking what's there. It's and, taking what's yeah, there. And, it's not creating and, anything new. That's from not it. inherently what creativity is. No. No. I mean, it makes, you know, it can make great PowerPoints, yeah. right? So if you're in, in the business of just making PowerPoints, yeah, your job's gonna go away, mm -hmm. right? Um, but but even so, there aren't that many people who just make PowerPoints for a living yeah, anymore. Exactly. All it will mean, because no one has an assistant anymore, is that people who make PowerPoints, like maybe me, mm -hmm. don't have to spend their time doing it, yeah. but I can think yeah. about the world yeah. um, and make connections um, that are truly creative, truly different, and truly boundary pushing in a way that I don't think AI will ever be yeah. able to do. You know, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I see it from uh, just the digital stuff that we do here at the cameras. The fact that there's so much AI put into that, it just eases the processes to be more creative because you're not sure, constrained it, 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 by it, those it, things. It gives more space yeah. to be truly creative. Mm -hmm. Now, this does create, um, you know, in income inequality issues for for, right, for, yeah. for 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 folks who aren't particularly specialized like you and I. Yeah. Um, or don't so, have access to the same Or don't have tools. access, you know, and, and that's where, you know, that's the role that policy has to play. Yeah. And I'm afraid in some ways policy is really focused on, you know, what if the AI takes over? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, the, the Terminator question is, is super fun and interesting, but policy really needs to be geared toward what I think is closer to the reality reality, which is how are you going to deal with the rapid elimination of a lot of functions, right, that are going to require, that are going to make winners and losers. They just are. Now, labor markets are so tight right now that at this moment in time, it's possible that you could have, you know, that eases the reallocation of people from one sector to another because labor markets are so tight and everybody's desperate for workers. Um, so. AI couldn't have come along at a better time. Yeah. And it's probably also the case that the labor shortage is part of the push to develop it. Mm -hmm. We need it. We just don't have enough people. And that's and that. And I think what, what you made the point of uh, retention is so critically important. And, and, and for companies to really focus on not just, it's just keeping the people you have and developing that and, and checking in and making sure that they stay because you're right. There's we don't the fallacy of kids don't want to work anymore, and it's like, well, no, that's not the case. It's they, not that people don't want to work. It's there's simply not enough people to go around mm -hmm. to provide the goods and services that will maintain the standard of living yeah. that we in the U.S. have become accustomed to, mm -hmm. and that the rest of the world deserves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The rest of the world deserves to live just like we do, and that will not happen unless the rest of the world can produce the yeah. way that we, we do. And AI is going to be part of that. It is. It, it, that's amazing. And, and you talked about 
technologies and you know mentioned the smartphone and that was you know the the last transformative the iphone really transformed so much yeah I, i'm economy. not buying into those goggly yeah things. i was going to ask you about nah. that you think that's a pivot no that's first pivot of all they're going to smudge my makeup yeah so I that's know. never going to work for me um and i'm looking for ai to truly enhance my human yeah. existence not what i feel would truly be a diminishment mm. of it um, I do think there's a certain segment of society that will embrace that kind of technology because, you know, they, they want that introverted yeah. experience that maybe is a little bit, you know, different. Yeah. Um, but, but nobody's going to be walking. You're not going to see a hundred people walk down the street with their, uh, their uh, augmented reality headsets on. You know, I'm, I I don't believe so. Not unless yeah. they can make them look like a pair of Gucci sunglasses. I, yeah, I guess we're not we're not we're not there yet. No, it's, but we might be one might day. Be, might be one day, right? I mean, little yeah. thick Gucci glasses. Yeah. But until they can make them look like Gucci glasses, Nobody's I'm not. I'm yeah. not. Mm, no, I mean, some people will. It's yeah. not that there's not a market, but for a pair of three thousand dollar ugly well, I goggles. Think that's the other nope. Three thousand dollars for for a, for for a, a pair of ugly first, goggles for ski goggles. Yeah. Nope. Mm -mm. So not, I, not buying it. Crypto was the thing. I mean, that was the, yeah, but at the same yeah, time, yeah. yeah. When you hear everybody talking about crypto, then yeah. you know that yeah. there's now, something. Now, don't bet against Apple. Yeah. I will say oh, that. Yeah. Don't bet against Apple and their ability to sort of bring the consumer something. But I, I read and I, I can't cite the article, but it was some commentary on it that basically made the point of the original iPhones weren't particular they were pretty clumsy as well yes. and sometimes you need consumers to tell you what they want to do with something mm -hmm. right that yep. it's going to take some consumer feedback for someone to go hey you know what you may think this is going to be used for video games but what it's really great for is surgery yeah. right and so I'm going to watch it for that. Yeah, it might be the product that changes perception in the public about maybe this is a concept that I could get along with if you develop it further down the line. Yeah, or maybe then, it gets, it's more, uh, maybe the use case is more in manufacturing, yeah. in business, or it makes engineering, workers, engineering, yeah, yeah. makes workers more productive. So instead of working eight hours a day, they can work four hours a yeah. day, which is what is the point? Yeah. More output, less effort. Less effort. Always, always, always. Yeah. I think there, there's so many topics to cover, and I think that, that, that you know, you did a fantastic job in your presentation covering a lot of stuff. And uh, I think the two things that you left with were really important. Today's consumer is different. The banks are different. They're not doing the, the crazy lending that they did in 2008. And have it for, and have, have it, for, it yeah. since then. Have it, exactly. have it since then. So it's been 12 years of really conservative lending practices so you really don't have kind of a credit bubble at the widespread consumer level yeah. like you saw in 08 and our savings 09. levels are higher yeah. yeah yeah the balance sheet of the consumer looks better yeah. right they've got money in the bank they've got money in housing they were supported throughout the pandemic exactly. so you know they had tons of income support not just from government by the way, no. it didn't just come from government. It also came from the fact that technology, this thing that we're talking about, allowed people to move to remote work during yep. the pandemic in industries that would have never been able to do it 10 years ago. And Even the ones, 10 years ago. The ones that said that we never could, um, that we would never consider it because it's impossible to do so. And what happened? The market forced them to do it. Market forced them to do it. And... You know, what could have been a, a possibility that, that you could have seen job losses in sectors beyond hospitality, hotel, and travel. Imagine those kind of job losses everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Devastating. I, yeah, I always looked at the pandemic. And, of course, D.C. is an odd metro area, and it's just, you know, it's not the same. You can't take it and copy and paste it. But whenever I was in the mall and you look and say, the luxury during the pandemic, the luxury stores have lines out the door. There's no way the economy is going down if 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 that's happening. It's just, There's just too much disposable income in the in the economy. Lots of disposable income and a very low unemployment rate. Yeah. So remember those two things together. So 3.7% yep. unemployment rate today pretty much means that anyone who wants a job has a job. That most of the unemployment that we're seeing out there, there are 6 million people unemployed mm -hmm. right now, but it's a very low percentage that are long-term yeah. unemployed. Right? And most of it's just transitioning out of, from one job exactly. to another. Exactly. A lot of it's that.
Well, I, 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 this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, I love this. Uh, it's been great. And again, I mean, um, just leading with our, I mean, I think the, the takeaway is that there's a rosy picture. Don't, there's no doom and gloom. Don't worry. You're not, you know, the economy's doing well. I think the firm's coming out with 42%, I think, positive finances. Um, you know, it's just, it's we're, we're doing okay. Yeah. yeah. It's doing okay. Well, not for ourselves. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the program. Thank you. Appreciate it. And again, this has been an episode of Engineering Info. It was a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies, and we'll see you next time.